Great, so as <clears throat> often happens, if we do have folks joining, it'll take just a moment for them to get woven into the meeting. So we'll just uh, get going in a moment here. And we do have people joining us quite remarkably. <clears throat> We're already up over 60 folks, 70 folks joining us. <clears throat> so let's just give it a moment to get everybody in and we'll get the meeting going. <clears throat> All right, we're just, looks like we're leveling off. Wonderful, okay. So welcome everybody, good morning. It's lovely to see your faces. This very first meeting in 2021 of the Maine Climate Council. Um, what a good crew. We also have over 117 people <clears throat> joining us uh, as observers today. So thanks uh, and welcome to all of you as well who are joining us um, and for this meeting. Um, I'm not going to say much more as introduction besides saying it's great to be with you all again. We're doing our usual Zoom thing here. Um, <clears throat> if you're having some internet challenges like I was having this morning, I uh, encourage you to switch to phone audio. And with that, I'll turn it over to <clears throat> Hannah Pingree, um, who will kick us off uh, in our meeting today. Great. Well, thank you, David. and. Um... Again, my name is Hannah Pingree. I am the co-chair of the Maine Climate Council. I'm here with Acting Commissioner Melanie Loisam, who hopefully will soon be no longer Acting Commissioner and Commissioner of the Maine DEP. Um, and we are excited to be back with you and the Maine Climate Council. Um, so just today is sort of the beginning of the, the new mode of the Maine Climate Council, where we all shift into a uh, what is our role now? And our role is to really monitor and make sure that progress is happening on the plan. And so I'm gonna talk uh, a little bit about first to celebrate the plan that we put out because we did a big big event on December 1 and then we've been all away from each other for a couple of months. So I think it is actually helpful and important to, to celebrate. Um, Melanie is gonna sort of start to ground us in where are we and what do we do now? And we're gonna have Sarah Kern as well from our team uh, walk through some more details. Um, we're gonna talk in detail a little bit about the equity subcommittee launch and we've got some exciting news on that and are happy to welcome um, uh, a new, a new co-chair for that, which I'll, I'll, I'll save for, for a few minutes from now. Um, and then we're gonna start to get into detail about what's happening with the main climate plan right now. The, um, legislature is in session, so a lot of the activity is focused on the main legislature. So Melanie and I will walk through some updates on that, and as well as some activity happening at the federal level. Um, I will say we're we're going to hear from a couple other Climate Council members who are um, actively engaged in these issues, um, and then we're going to talk about what our next steps are. So that's kind of our overview for the meeting, um, and we will really just get right into it. Um, you you have noted we've moved to a slightly shorter meeting format. Um, I think Br Commissioner Bruce Van Note was like, we're busy, we're in the middle of a legislative session. So I think we'll, we will meet for shorter periods of time um, for the next two meetings. But I think depending on the work and the discussions, um, you know, when we can all get back together again, um, we'll, we'll, we'll see what we have to do and, and maybe have some longer meetings in the fall. Um, so again, just great to see you all. Um, Melanie, you wanna say anything else just to kick off? No, nope, just good morning. And as David said, it's good to see everybody again. Looking forward to taking the next steps towards implementation. Great. All right. So I'm going to um, just walk through a couple of slides, and I would really call them sort of celebration slides. Um, Cass, you want to move to the next one? So the plan. You've all seen this. I hope everyone got their copy at home. Um, I will just say for, for everyone out there uh, watching um, the, the Maine Climate Council plan, if you haven't heard, we have a website, climatecouncil.maine.gov, where you can download the PDF. We do have printed copies, and um, you can go to our website and request a printed copy. Obviously, um, they are limited. So, um, But again, if you haven't shared it with your friends yet, please do. So next slide. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go through this. I know that um, you all, most of you were there for the event. Um, next slide. 
I think we we felt really positive about everybody's engagement. Obviously, it was a big day. I think um, the fact that the Maine Climate Council kicked off in in September of uh, 2019 with Gina McCarthy, and then we um, launched our plan uh, with Secretary Kerry. I think we we had not. Um, predicted that those two would be the two top climate leads internationally and nationally uh, in the incoming administration. But obviously, uh, Maine won't, won't wait, as goes Maine, what, whatever you want to uh, attribute to it. But I, I felt, I think we should all feel really good about the fact that we had um, both of Maine's two legislative leaders, all four members of our delegation, um, and obviously our governor uh, leading the charge and launching the plan. I think it certainly shows the significant support, the bipartisan support um, for climate action in Maine. And we have continued to hear, I think, positive comments from members of the Maine legislature on both sides of the aisle. Uh, Melanie and I have been briefing uh, members of the legislature. The We just briefed the Environment and Natural Resources Committee with, with many of you on this Zoom screen. Um, so we will continue to kind of spread the word about the climate plan. But again, um, just I, I think we should all feel really positive about the, the launch and where we are. Um, so Tony and our team, I think, uh, just a, has put together a couple of slides sort of outlining some of the press. Um, next slide. Um, and I, I would say, you know, some people said, well, I, I, I'm not sure if I saw that much press activity. Obviously, it's been a busy couple months for the world. Uh, there's a lot happening and a lot has happened in uh, November, December, and, and January, but I think that we saw incredibly positive um, uh, editorial boards from both Portland and Bangor talking about the importance and the sort of uh, weight and gravity of the Climate Action Plan. Um, lots of good news coverage. Next slide. Um, and we can send these clips out if you haven't seen them. I will say we saw lots of sort of detailed um, publications. We saw, you know, groups like the Island Institute and Maine Farmland Trust really talking specifically about the climate plan and what it means for their organization, what they're going to do. Um, I think we are seeing that from sort of organizations all over Maine who now see this as a roadmap for their work, which I think is it's something, you know, a lot of people are saying, what is the state going to do? How are you going to make this happen? And we are all working seriously and diligently on that across state government. But I think the fact that so many other organizations and people and communities are reading this plan and talking about what is in it for us, how do we <clears throat> start to take action locally, how does our organization participate, um, I think that that's just a really good sign about, you know, the, the high level and, and the work and the time that, that everyone um, put into it. Next slide. Uh, so there's Cassie, um, our awesome Climate Council coordinator, um, and I think we put together a couple of the different tweets of the different states and different people around the country who were talking about it, um, the climate launch, um, some again, some good coverage of, of Se Secretary Kerry, and obviously having his his presence there was, was a big deal. Next slide. Um, so... Again, we will talk a little bit at the end um, of this, and it will be kind of the the work of, of the Climate Council and, and many of you giving your input as to how we continue. Um, this was not a plan that we launched just to, to launch and then, you know, not continue to talk about it. So we are continuing to think very actively about communications and how we make sure that, that people understand it, but not, you know, not every gory detail, but what does it mean for their community um, and for them personally, what can they do? Um, but again, um, I, I just really want to appreciate uh, my team, um, Tony, Sarah, Brian, Taylor, um, Kathy, um, many uh, folks across the departments and state government, a, a lot of the co-chairs, all of the co-chairs, working group members who really helped to make it happen. I don't know if we adequately thank you December 1, but just really feel very grateful um, for all of your hard work. I think people... Um, feel good about the launch of the plan. And again, um, just want to appreciate it a little bit because we're going to spend the rest of the meeting talking about, all right, now we got to get to work and really make sure that we are making things happen. And I think uh, many of us know we are making things happen already. Um, but I think, uh, again, just a little celebration of, of where we are and, and all the hard work that went into it. Um, again, a lot of leaders, um, all of you on the Climate Council coming together to help us make it happen. So again, 
thank you all uh, one last time. And um, I'm sure we'll have other things to thank you for, but I think it's just important to really uh, feel good about where we are. And, and now, um, as I think Melanie will best say, it's really now get back to work. So I'll pass it off to Melanie. Next slide. Thanks, Anna. Um, so this is a slide, obviously, you've all seen before and uh, worth going over just quickly as a reminder how far we've come and how quickly and how much has been accomplished. So June of 2019, uh, the governor signed LD 1679 into law. Just a few months later, you were all brought together. And a little over a year after that, after COVID and cats and kids and everything else, you produced a plan which has enormous goals in it for us to accomplish and a fantastic level of detail for everyone to now proceed forward with implementation. And you all have a great energy and there's momentum and everybody is ready to go. And now we're plowing forward into the legislative session. And for many of you, you understand what that means and how much it can, uh, add additional layers of discussion to all the work that you've already done. And so, you know, we are rolling out to you today some of the ways that we're gonna be measuring that um, and moving forward with figuring out how in the agencies we do this work and then bringing that back to you as feedback to figure out what actions we take next in implementation of the plan. Next slide. So just another reminder, I think you all know this, how many people have come together to make this happen. The expertise, the commitment, the time that's been spent, our scientists, our industry leaders, more than 230 people have contributed to this and everybody is committed and we appreciate that so much because as I've said before, when we identify what we need to do this, we're gonna need everybody to come to the table and be ready to you know, really put their pencils to the paper and make this work. Um, in addition to all of the work that's already been done, the council recommended creation of an equity subcommittee and we'll be introducing that committee later on, but we're pleased to add that kind of consideration to our ongoing work to consider the diverse needs of Mainers in our state. Next slide. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Curran. Melanie. Um, so good morning, everyone. I'm just going to talk briefly about the roles and responsibilities of the different entities on that org chart that Melanie was showing. Um, it has shifted a little bit after the release of the plan. So I just want to kind of highlight what everybody will be doing over the next year. Um, so first, the main climate council. So the council is required by statute to meet quarterly to monitor progress on the implementation of the climate action plan. And then that monitoring and, and momentum informs the start of the next climate action plan, which is due on December 1st, 2024. Next slide, please. The working groups are required to meet two times per year. Uh, their role is also to monitor progress and to advise on implementation um, as requested by state agencies and the legislature. And so I want to highlight, um, Tony's going to talk later in the meeting about how we're thinking about monitoring progress and activity and all of the effort Hannah was describing that is taking place not just within state agencies, but in different organizations and groups around the state. And so I want to just flag that we see that as a really important role of the working groups in terms of helping us to understand all of the great work that is happening um, so that we can, can get a good sense of activity and momentum and communicate that to the main public. Next slide, please. The Science and Technical Subcommittee will continue to highlight the critical scientific and monitoring data gaps. That's been a really important role for them and they'll continue to work with the working groups and other stakeholders to do that. And then also to continue to monitor climate change impacts. Um, they did an amazing assessment in a very rapid time frame to inform the work of this council over the last year. And I know Ivan and Bob are already thinking about what the next assessment looks like um, and how it can be most helpful to the planning. And now I will turn it back to Melanie for the next slide, please. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, with that, I'm excited to introduce our co-chairs for the new Equity Subcommittee of the Maine Climate Council, Penobscot Nation Ambassador Molly and Dana, and Portland City Councilor Spencer Thibodeau. 
Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you to Director Pingree, Commissioner Loisem, um, Governor Mills, and all of my colleagues on the Climate Council that continue this really important work. And I guess I can give an update on the new developments around the Subcommittee uh, on Equity. So I remember reading the Mitchell report and feeling very inspired by it, the, the report on equity for, for the entire climate report and also felt it was a really great starting point to dig in um, to this work much deeper. So through the, the vision and leadership of the co-chairs of the Climate Council, we um, been meeting to strategize around the membership, the uh, goals, the outcomes, and we are super excited to update today on the process. Uh, I guess the first big announcement, <laughs> as we've already heard, is that uh, the co-chair will be Portland City Council member uh, Spencer Thibodeau, and I've long admired his work and leadership in our state and very honored um, to share this work with him. So welcome, Spencer. I wish I could see you. <laughs> I'm looking at this slide, but um, it'll be, be great to hear from you in a few minutes. So the way our work will kind of shake out is we will meet monthly. We have our first meeting February 26th. Uh, Friday mornings kind of work the best for um, children's schedule and all of that. <laughs> so we're going to look at the different work of the working groups and we will assess equity around each area and talk about the um, outcomes and goals. And you know, from a, a personal standpoint, I'm so happy to see equity work kind of merging with climate work. And it's so important um, to really hold up the, the most vulnerable in our state and our country. And I am uh, just remain honored and thankful to be able to do this. So unless I missed anything, <laughs> I can introduce uh, our co-chair, Councillor Spencer Thibodeau. Thank you all. Um, thank you, Ambassador Dana. I really am excited to work with you as well. And um, like every person, I made a New Year's resolution in 2021 that I was not going to take on any additional responsibilities. And then on January 3rd, uh, Hannah Pingree called uh, with a challenge. And, um, you know, this, this issue is just too important to sit on the sidelines. And so I'm excited to um, work with Ambassador Daner, to work with, um, with Hannah and, and others um, to meet people where they are um, and to uh, address the issue of equity as it pertains to um, climate action planning and, um, and issues associated with how we meet our climate um, goals. And so I'm honored, um, really excited to co-chair this committee and, um, and let's get to work. <laughs> Great. Excellent. Okay, so um, that's an exciting development. Um, unless um, Hannah and Melanie, you have additional updates around what's going on, let's do a quick round of Q and A, um, and see if folks have any doubts or any comments they want to make about um, what's just been talked about, whether it's the new work of the Equity Subcommittee, or more generally, who's doing what this year going forward. Any questions, comments, thoughts? This is uh, Representative Lydia Bloom. I have a I have a thought that just sort of occurred to me as we're talking about progress. I was thinking that maybe we should look at each of the um, strategies and assess where what you know what what legislation is is applying to each strategy, what legislation will affect the uh, progress of each strategy and look at it in that way to see how we're doing. Um, that was just there's something that just occurred to me. What does everyone else think about that? L looking at our progress in terms of the strategies and saying which, which legislation, which work that, that uh, Hannah mentioned by other groups um, are, are making progress with those strategies. Representative Bloom, I think that's a good suggestion. I mean, I think I think Melanie and I, and, and with the help of a couple of others, we'll talk about some of the bills that the governor outlined December 1, activities going forward. Um, but I think that there's a lot of other activity in the legislature, you know, 
complimentary, some stuff that might be concerning, I think, you know, and, and clearly, as we were talking about before this call started, um, there are many bills that haven't been printed, we actually don't know what they are. So I think that exactly that kind of tracking um, with the help of, of a lot of the other commissioners and people who are engaged in the legislative process um, would be helpful. So I think uh, we are meeting again in May and we, we don't think the legislature is, they're not typically done in May, they're supposed to adjourn mid-June. So that could be a good time to sort of uh, continue, figure out a way to, to, to understand the full landscape and, and sort of track them against what's happening in the legislative process. I think there's a similar effort a lot of us are thinking about in terms of uh, federal activity and funding opportunities, because I think a lot of this does come back to how are we gonna take action and in many areas, how do we pay for it? So. Um, I would also add that many of the agencies, DEP included, is doing, um, I hesitate to call it a deep dive, but really looking at each one of the actions in the implementation chart and figuring out where it fits within the existing programs, like the chart, you know, identifies in a lot of cases and trying to figure out where legislation is even going to be needed potentially in the future. So there are a lot of things that are happening through, uh, you know, ongoing program implementation that now they can incorporate some of those actions into their work. Um, so I think that we're going to have a lot of really great feedback from um, the executive branch side on the implementation question going into like the second half of the session. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Um, other uh, comments or questions at this stage? Uh, Kate, go ahead, please. Yeah, just super quickly, I just want to um, thank Ambassador Dana and Councillor Thibodeau for stepping into this leadership role. Yes, New Year's was supposed to bring some, some calm to all of our lives. Um, so thanks for stepping in. And I I know I, I'm, I'm making an assumption, but I think it's a safe one that, um, that I think as a council, we also want to make, it's not that this isn't happening, but I want to offer the integration. So however, those of us who aren't on your working team can help, you know, we're here. And I think what what is so important, as you said, Ambassador, is this, the merging, which has always been there, but we're beginning to recognize that more and more. So I hope that we continue to merge. So thanks. Excellent. Yeah, I think that's a good comment, Kate. And I think that um, we've had some good conversations with the, the two co-chairs. I mean, I think Ambassador Dana has a good perspective as a legislator on the whole picture. I think Spencer's coming from Portland, South Portland, putting out a very bold and, and plan that's not dissimilar from our climate plan. It really covers all aspects of climate activity. So I think um, as, as we think about that work, I think we think it's in integrated with every single working group and that they are kind of kind of go through the, their process like month by month. All right, what do we, let's talk about buildings. Let's think about you know, equity and weatherization. And, and so I think there's a really a, a role for a lot of the folks, um, you know, across all of the varying policy issues. I, I will just say, also say um, there are four or five climate council members who've expressed an interest and in, are, are going to be joining um, the uh, equity subcommittee. And we're working with Ambassador Dana and, and Councillor Thibodeau on, on having the full slate of the committee, really making sure it's broad and diverse and, you know, has varying different experiences and expertise and, and that group will be, we'll make sure we share with you all the members, um, I would say in the next week or so as they are, everyone agrees. We've, we've invited folks, but trying to make sure that they're all on the hook. So thanks, Kate. Great. Any other comments or questions before we shift gears and hear about um, the legislative update that Hannah has previewed. Anything else right now on our minds? Go hey, ahead. David, it's, it's Sandy. I've just got a, a quick uh, question, maybe comment. Hannah, you referenced it earlier, but that we have a federal administration that believes in climate change now and, and is taking action for equitable response to climate change. And um, I'm just wondering, how do we court, how do we monitor that and coordinate it with what we're doing. Obviously, funding's important, but also basically building the movement. 
And uh, so I'm just sort of wondering how we're how we're planning to do that and sort of latch on to this while we can, because it's so promising after the executive order passed last week. Yeah, Sandy, great question. I mean, Belly and I will hit that a little bit in the next presentation. We're going to get Dan Burgess and, and um, Commissioner Amanda Beal to also help. I mean, I think it's uh, we're we're getting some good and helpful information from the U.S. Climate Alliance. I think we're meeting with all four members of our congressional delegation. I think there's exciting activity, but it's a certainly you know lots of new activity in Washington as well. So I think really. We are we are trying to wrap our minds around it, make sure that we are ready to to seize on opportunities for Maine. Um, I think there is exciting activity at FEMA. I see um, uh, Doug Barnum out there somewhere. So I think we're we're really trying to make. There's so many different realms and and levels. So I think it's it's um, just making sure that we're on top of it. And I think it's going to be an issue that we want to keep the Climate Council updated on because I think it will present a lot of opportunities for for taking action with the support of the federal government with funding opportunities and, and potentially, you know, specific regulation and legislation as well. That may be a heavier lift, but we're all, we're all watching. So we'll keep you posted. Uh, can I add that um, I've talked to the National Conference of Environmental Legislators and asked them specifically about helping us as legislators understand what the federal what's going on in the federal uh, arena and how that's going to affect state legislators. Uh, so that's so we're we're trying as well to get other uh, input uh, so we, are, we can keep up to date as well. But I think it's really going to affect our funding plans, which is great. And I will just that's say, a, uh, Dan, Dan, may, Dan Burgess may also speak to this, um, but and, and I'm sure a lot of the commissioners we are having positive outreach from the White House, from members of Congress who are sort of seeking input from states that are already putting together climate plans and taking action. So I, I think it, it definitely seems like a collaborative relationship is already happening and, and will obviously help to build stronger um, partnerships with states who are, who are doing this work. I think that's a good segue into our next set of um presentation our next presentation, which is about legislative work and a mention of this, these federal opportunities. So why don't we segue into that and then continue this conversation if needed uh, about these federal opportunities on the back end of that. Um, Hannah, were you gonna kick off this conversation around um, the legislation? Yes, yeah, so, so Melanie and I will give um, a little bit of an overview of sort of to some way, degree, it's a it's a reminder of what the governor said on December one. We haven't actually it's not a lot of uh, new stuff, but it's it's a lot, so it's good just to sort of stay updated on on what uh, specifically the administration is pursuing um, as it relates to this legislative session. Uh, we'll talk a little bit also about uh, funding, and again, actually a little bit of a recap of what we know, um, sort of the highlights of what's happening in Washington, um, and then again, we'll hear from from Dan uh, and Commissioner um, uh, of Agriculture, Conservation, Forestry, uh, specifically on what's um, happening in those two arenas. I think there, there are definitely many other departments with some exciting activity, but we felt like there was some good stuff to talk about from, from those two at first. So um, Cassie, will you just bring us back to the slide deck? Great. So, this may look familiar to, to some of you, um, but I think uh, when we think about implementing the plan and the kind of legislation and other executive orders, the, the, the activity that we are um, really focused on and promoting um, this kind of, these are the major bullets. Um, there are many other bills in the legislature that we are monitoring, um, you know, the, certainly that we may be supportive of as we understand um, what they're trying to accomplish. Um, but these were sort of the things that that the governor felt um, and our team felt really were, were most important to take action on um, soonest. Um, so the, I'm going to let Dan Burgess talk a little bit about energy as well as um, transportation. Um, the, and I'm going to let Amanda Beal talk about uh, forest and sequestration because I think there's some exciting activity there and a specific effort that, that she can really highlight the details of that. Um, so I'm going to let... Uh, pass it off to Melanie to talk about sea level rise. 
Thanks, Anna. Um, so I'll just touch on what we've sort of already described to you all in the past that we're introducing a resolve that will direct the Department of Environmental Protection as well as other agencies to review the laws and the rules that we administer and identify where it's appropriate to incorporate the 3.9 feet of sea level rise by 2100. That's based on the tremendous science-based work of the Science and Technical Subcommittee that was what that committee was charged with doing is producing a number for us in the state to use, to point to, to plan for when we consider various development projects, you know, expansions of infrastructure, where we make investments in wastewater treatment, we need to be taking into consideration the effects that we're seeing of rising sea levels along our shoreline. That resolve will point to the recommendations of the Resiliency Subcommittee, so it also incorporates the important work that that group did to already do that kind of review and get us to the next step of being able to now evaluate how to incorporate that through rulemaking or through legislation. Um, also, while I've got the mic, I'll also just mention our HFC bill. That's the same legislation that was introduced last year. That's an important step to reduce the emissions of super pollutants in our state. Uh, this is consistent with efforts that are being undertaken in other states and also now some action that's happening at the federal level. That is LB226 for those who are interested. Um, and hopefully that will be one that we can move forward on quickly to uh, put some prohibitions in place on the use of those chemicals. With that, I'll give it back to Hannah. Great, thanks Melanie. And again, those bills, we actually got a unanimous support of the Environment and Natural Resources Committee um, and then COVID hit and everything got stalled. So hoping uh, for a smooth process on that. But I think as we update you on these bills, I mean, I think David will help lead a little discussion on this, but I think thinking about how climate council members um, certainly no obligation, but we wanna keep you posted on the legislation moving forward. And it's obviously um, helpful uh, for, for anybody who has scientific expertise, who wants to advocate to their legislators um, the, kinds of, um, the kinds of pieces of legislation that we're moving forward. Uh, so the lead by example plan, something highlighted uh, in the buildings working group, you know, how does the state as well as other entities really uh, show how um, efficient buildings, changes in um, technology, how uh, renewables can lead by example. Um, so we have specifically been working um, based on an executive order signed by the governor uh, a year ago on a plan for state government, how to how the state government can lead by example. I'll let Dan talk a little bit more about that, but we've been working closely with Elaine Clark at DAFs, um, as well as commissioners um, and other leaders across state government um, on an exciting plan. Um, Efficiency Maine will, will play a major role in that as well. So I think um, you know, state government has a, a big footprint, and so finding ways to really have the state lead in this area um, are important. Um, I will also just say there are a couple of bills which, which the governor named, um, things like appliance standards, um, commercial PACE financing for, for renewables. Um, we want to continue to to engage in a process around green finance opportunities. There's a couple different bills before the main legislature in that arena that we're interested in gonna stay engaged on. Um, we, the, the climate plan specifically highlighted the need for um, careful study and sort of thinking on, on solar siting to continue to encourage renewables, but also make sure that they're well sited um, as well as land, other land use issues and, and power sector transformation, which Again, I'll let Dan Burgess um, hit that one because it's really uh, part, part of the major recommendations of the energy working group. Uh, next slide. So one of the things uh, the governor uh, highlighted, you know, as we think about how do we start paying for action? Um, what are the mechanisms available to the state? I think clearly we are in a challenging economic period, uh, challenging economic period for the state budget, certainly for Maine people. And so um, I will say in the next couple of weeks, um, you, will, you will see a recommendation from the governor around a bond package um, that really highlights how we get people back to work and invest in our infrastructure. Um, I won't go into all the details of that because I think that's, um, we are still working with, with leaders on both sides of the aisle to think about that, but um, the municipal infrastructure, really the state adaptation fund concept 
um, is, is likely to be in that package. Um, obviously some good activity at the federal level around FEMA dollars. So wanting to make sure that Maine is, has, has state funds available to support um, major municipal adaptation projects. So I think that's, that's a big one and an important one um, for the Climate Council to monitor and, and support uh, where you feel comfortable. Um, the plan called to double the pace of weatherization that requires funding beyond what Efficiency Maine and Maine Housing currently has available. Um, so looking to make investments in increasing the pace of weatherization and supporting other local efficiency projects. Um, other types of state and local infrastructure, uh, culvert projects, um, multimodal transportation, wastewater and drinking water, uh, broadband infrastructure, as well as support for heritage industries, our forestry industry, our you know, agricultural processing, things that were highlighted um, as a part of the climate plan. Um, obviously a lot of exciting, uh, I think a lot of good response to the um, aspects of the climate plan that were about agriculture, fishing, forestry. Um, so really wanting to continue to follow up and, and put some meaningful um, investment behind um, that activity. Obviously also a lot on, uh, on doubling the pace of clean energy and efficiency jobs. The governor's goal, try to hit 30,000 jobs by 2030. So obviously we need to keep training electricians and HVAC technicians and engineers. And, and that really um, happens at the, from the high school level to the graduate level. So investments in our workforce. Um, and then last but not least, certainly investments in natural and working lands, um, programs like LMF, as well as infrastructure at our state parks. So. I will say um, we will keep you posted on, on the release of the governor's bond package. Um, it requires a two thirds vote of the main legislature. So certainly looking for, for bipartisan support um, from legislators across Maine and, and, and we'll keep you posted on how that goes. Next slide. Uh, so I won't talk a lot about this. I think we, you saw this slide when we, when we launched the plan, um, but clearly we have um, activity and funding already happening in state government. I think Melanie really referred to state agencies kind of thinking about how they implement the climate plan uh, somewhat within existing programs. Um, obviously there's only so much can happen within existing programs, but there certainly is funding already uh, being spent, certainly significant amounts of funding in areas like Efficiency Maine, um, DOT, uh, the Lie Heat Program, um, weatherization efforts at Maine Housing. So really we are uh, making sure that we are maximizing the programs we have to help implement the climate plan. Uh, next slide. So I think there's, there's this is sort of a couple of the questions that were asked. Uh, this is really um, absolutely not the full list of things happening in Washington, DC. Um, you know, the, the list of Biden executive orders that have some climate impact are, are significant. Um, some of the ones I just wanted to highlight that overlap uh, with the climate plan. Um, uh, Commissioner Be Beal may talk a little bit about the land and water conservation fund, something passed in the last Congress and we're waiting for, for federal rules, but could be a good funding opportunity for the state of Maine. Um, I'll let Dan talk about some of the significant energy legislation also passed at the end of the last Congress, um, a number of different efforts that certainly help on the renewable energy front. Uh, a new program uh, through FEMA called the Storm Grant Program uh, was signed in 2020, um, giving specific resilience and adaptation funds to state. It's not a huge amount of money, but there has been certainly uh, announcements about uh, the Biden administration freeing up much more significant FEMA funding for disaster and pre-disaster funds, which really could help support climate activity. Uh, obviously, big news that the first thing that, that Biden did was rejoin the Paris Climate Accords, um, committing the U.S. to um, 2025 emission reductions. Uh, Maine was already a part of that through the U.S. Climate Alliance. Um, but I would say that it is, there has been an announcement that on Earth Day, the state, um, the country will uh, make some new announcement about what the federal emission reduction goals will be. And so um, we'll obviously all be following that. If anything, I would, I would imagine it would actually be quite close to what um, Maine has already uh, committed to. So Maine is leading, Maine won't wait, um, but it's good to see the federal government um, starting to participate. 
Uh, Biden set a 30% conservation goal for federal lands and waters. Um, again, very similar, exactly what we put in our climate plan. Uh, he also um, redirected uh, the return to aggressive fuel efficiency standards, obviously something incredibly important for our climate plan. We, we want the cars on the road and the new cars people buy in the next couple of years um, to be as efficient as possible. So that is extremely helpful to our trajectory to reduce emissions. Um, he also signaled that the federal government would commit to a 100% electric vehicles in the federal fleet. Um, he did that the day before uh, General Motors announced that they were going to um, move to an all EV fleet, an all EV production um, by 2035. So obviously um, a lot of discussion about are our EV goals in Maine achievable, but clearly the activity happening with automakers and on the federal get level show that this is the, the direction the world is going. Um, and last, I will just say we have heard uh, through a variety of sources, including what you can read in the newspaper, that um, a federal infrastructure bill is anticipated. Um, certainly the earlier discussion was February. Other people may have more advanced information on when that might come, but uh, both climate and Build Back Better themes have been a part of that. So we do um, imagine that that will um, be extremely helpful to states across the country uh, for transportation opportunities, infrastructure opportunities, electric vehicle charging, a lot of the specific items um, that we know that we have in our plan and we need help from federal funding agencies to really make them happen as soon as possible. So I think that's exciting. And, and again, we will uh, continue to, to keep folks posted. So that's kind of the overview from our end, but um, we wanted uh, to, to let um, Director Dan Burgess, uh, the head of the Governor's Energy Office, as well as Commissioner Amanda Beal go into a little more detail about um, both some of the activities at the state level and federal level. They both have a lot going on, like all commissioners. Um, so I will uh, pass it off to Dan. Thanks, Hannah. Uh, a lot, a lot uh, in what you covered, and I'll try not to duplicate duplicate a lot of, of what's uh, what's going on. So, you know, I think as folks know, there were a few recommendations um, in the energy um, component of the report. The first being to ensure the adequate, affordable, clean energy supply. And so we're we're working on a number of different activities related to that. The first is the completion of a renewable portfolio standard report. So it's a report on how to best meet our 2030 80 percent. RPS that will be out um, in the next kind of week to 10 days. Uh, the report, the, the Climate Council report did point directly to that as being kind of a really important piece of, of informing our, our next steps forward. So we're excited to get that released and to have that kind of be informative for how we how we meet our 2030 objectives and, and beyond. Um, I think, you know, with that, there's going to be a number of different pieces of legislation. Hannah mentioned CPACE and appliance standards, but I think our our read is that there's over 100 energy bills um, that have been filed, or at least in, in name, and so we'll we'll be working through those closely. Um, it's pretty clear that um, there's a number with uh, the solar and net, net metering kind of in the in the title or, or or in the mix. I think there's a few more on on the opportunity to advance um, um, some of the larger scale renewable generation through additional utilities commission procurements, which have been very successful here in the state. Um, and so we'll be, you know, there's others on green financing, um, you know, a, a number of different items. And so we'll be looking at those, uh, uh, tracking them. And I'm sure many folks on this call will be will be engaged on them throughout the session. Um, and we'll make sure that, um, uh, that uh, please keep an eye out for the RPS report coming out coming out soon to help inform some of that work. On the, continuing on the supply side, the offshore wind um, is continues to be a priority. Uh, we're as you know, the governor has announced an intent to do a, to move forward to the research array, array 20 to 40 miles off the coast, uh, 10 to 12 turbines. Um, and we are working uh, through a stakeholder process right now to identify where that site uh, would be located. Um, she did announce the intent uh, uh, to pursue a state uh, waters moratorium for new uh, offshore wind development in the state. So that is within three miles. Uh, we're gonna uh, pursue a pause of development in those areas. Not including the the Aqua Venice project that that's off the coast, uh, slated to be off the coast of Monhegan, that demonstration project, but really kind of signaling a, a focus to move towards federal waters, which are are three miles and out. 
And so um, wanted to um, highlight that as, as you know, obviously an, an important activity. On the um, clean transportation EV side, uh, we are working to pull together a group of, of um, in, internal uh, uh, agencies and others who are involved in transportation and will want to, um, you know, work with the transportation working group and others to identify, you know, the what, uh, how the roadmap process should work. Um, I think that it's a, uh, a hope to have more to say on that fairly soon. We're making pretty good progress so, and hope to have that kicked off um, relatively soon. I will say some good news that just came out this morning is that according to Plug in America, which is a, a group which tracks and does a lot in the EV space, Maine was actually listed in the top 10 states that are uh, moving forward with the EV policy, which is exciting. Um, puts us in good, good company and I think is, um, you know, uh, uh, result of a lot of hard work by a number of folks on, on, on this call. Uh, four out of the top 10 states are actually in New England. So I think we're in good, good company in New England. Um, Hannah, you mentioned the leading by example plan, so I probably won't get much more into that, but it's really about starting to track kind of how the state is doing with regards to uh, leading on our clean energy and climate goals. We'll be working to set a baseline, understand kind of the existing initiatives and working on how best to, to move move things forward, both on, and, and I think it meant much the same way that the Climate Council looked at it and in, in the different sectors of where the emission pieces are, emission sources are coming from. And then, you know, I think finally, uh, Hannah, you mentioned a lot of activity on the federal government. I think, um, if, this, if folks aren't aware, the um, uh, probably the, the most comprehensive energy legislation in a, in a decade was passed at the end of last year. Um, the, um, and there were a number of different things included in that, including the extension of, of tax credits for, for solar, for wind, the inclusion of a new offshore wind tax credit, more uh, innovation opportunities in, in the weatherization assistance programming, um, a lot of um, um, R&D opportunities across the spectrum, but uh, particularly focused on energy storage. So we're, we're still going through that as to, to understand the, um, how, how it impacts Maine. And then, as Hannah mentioned, we're keeping a close eye on everything that's happening down in D.C. now with potential stimulus, infrastructure bills, um, and others uh, to how to position Maine to be in the best place possible. So I was I think that's within my five minutes and a lot, a lot going on and I'm happy to take questions here or offline as, as folks um, want to hear more. Thanks so much, um, Director Burgess. I think we're gonna pivot uh, to uh, Commissioner Amanda Beal now to hear more about natural working lands and some of the issues that, that you're working on, Commissioner Beal. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so I, I'll say a little bit about um, just sort of where uh, some of the work coming out of the Natural and Working Lands Group is uh, headed. And also I'll talk about some things that are happening within our department. And also I'll touch on state and federal policy. So uh, just to say that Tom Abello and I, Tom, who's the co-chair of the Natural Working Lands Group, and I will be reaching out to members of that work group uh, soon to schedule a meeting. Um, but right now we're in the midst of launching two processes to dig deeper into some key areas of the natural and working lands recommendations to the Climate Council. And the first, which Hannah touched on, is uh, the Forest Carbon Program Task Force, which was authorized by Governor Mills in an executive order signed on January 13th. And this task force will begin its work later this month and we'll be making recommendations uh, with a deadline of September 1st for the development of a voluntary incentive-based program for woodland owners of 10 to 10,000 acres and forestry practitioners to increase carbon storage in Maine's forests. And I just wanted to say thanks to GoPIF who are uh, in the midst of putting up a, uh, a page that will um, keep people up to date on when those meetings are happening and any materials. Uh, that we are distributing in case they want to uh, follow along and make public comment um, at our meetings. And the second uh, thing that's underway is a solar land use stakeholder group. So we as a department were working on land use legislation last session, which included solar siting on agricultural and forestry land, but we decided to hit the pause button in order to get more stakeholder engagement, including from municipalities. 
but we'll be working with Dan uh, and folks in the governor's energy office to convene this group in the coming months. And like other departments, as Commissioner Loisem mentioned, uh, is happening within DEP and, and lots of other state agencies, we are working to inventory our existing programs and activities that are already addressing climate change adaptation and or mitigation, as well as identifying what additional resources would be needed to fully implement the climate action plan strategies that pertain to our work. And so some of the highlights of what we're already doing at DACF include, um, the, main, the Land for Maine's Future program in the Bureau, Bureau of Resource Information and Land Use Planning has held a two-day workshop on climate, carbon, and resilience to develop, develop strategies on how LMF can incorporate climate resilience and carbon sequestration into its priorities for land conservation. We've also recently released our technical guidance for utility scale solar installation and development on agricultural, forested and natural lands. And that can be found on our website at uh, DACF. A carbon storage assessment is underway in partnership with the Nature Conservancy and the University of Maine on the Bureau of pa uh, Parks and Lands um, Ecological Reserve Lands. And also technical assistance through several programs within our Bureau of Forestry are addressing climate mitigation through forestry management and invasive pest mitigation strategies. And our Bureau of Agriculture is uh, actively having conversations with NRCS, DEP, the University of Maine and others interested in how we can cooperate to promote healthy soil practices on farms throughout Maine and to improve agricultural productivity and resilience while also providing public benefits to water quality and carbon sequestration. And uh, as, as Hannah alluded to, you know, the, the legislation or the legislative session is really picking up steam. Um, but there are a lot of bills that we don't have um, that haven't been printed yet, so we don't know exactly what's in them. So we're keeping keeping a close eye and we're having many discussions with legislators and others just to stay informed and be part of the conversation of how those policies develop. Um, we're, of course, very interested in some of the uh, bond bills that are proposing funding for the Land for Maine's Future program and our state parks and we'll be continuing to uh, follow along. And also I'll say that um, we've been in a number of discussions with other, legislature, uh, other legislators about bills pertaining to soil health, solar siting, food system investments, and uh, a number of other relevant issues. So I look forward to being able to share more about that as the legislative session goes on. And as far as what's happening at the federal level, I think we all know that the 25 states and territories in the US Climate Alliance, which we are one of, have been really leading the charge on climate action. And nationally, of course, there's growing momentum to address climate mitigation and adaptation through better management of our natural and working lands. And we expect to see even more alignment, of course, with the new uh, administration's policies related to climate change. And on that front, uh, I know you all are aware of President Biden's January 27th executive order on tackling the climate crisis. Uh, and it called for establishing a civilian climate corps to conserve and restore public lands and waters, increase carbon sequestration in the agricultural sector and protect biodiversity. And this order also establishes a, the, the goal that uh, Hannah mentioned earlier about conserving 30% of our lands and waters by 2030, which of course has a lot of alignment with where we ended up with our climate action plan. And it also instructs the USDA to encourage voluntary ad adoption of climate smart agricultural and forestry practices that result in additional measurable and verifiable carbon reductions and sequestration. So again, a lot of alignment with what we've been talking about over the past uh, several months. And finally, as Hannah mentioned, we're definitely enthusiastic about funding for the Land and Water Conservation Fund. The legislation that passed uh, directs the use of royalties from offshore oil and natural gas to permanently fund the Land and Water Conservation Fund to the tune of $900 million a year to invest in conservation and recreation op opportunities across the country. So that's where we are to date. Um, a lot of good momentum underway, but also a lot of work ahead and we're really excited to dig in. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Beal, that's fantastic. I know um, Brian Ambrett had some uh, 
a few slides and then we'll go, we'll open this up for conversation and some dialogue. Um, Brian, go ahead if you had a few uh, points to make. Great, thanks David and good morning council members. It's fantastic to be with you all again. On December 1st, Governor Mills listed a community resilience pilot project as a near-term priority for implementation of the climate action plan. And you'll recall these maps from the plan where the reds and the oranges show where municipal and regional capacity for climate resilience planning is thin or non-existent on the ground. So we have a big lift ahead of us to ensure that communities are supported in their work to build resilience as we implement the climate plan. GOPIF has been coordinating with Judy East, Bob Marvini, and Kathleen Layden in putting the final touches on the rollout of a pilot project. And we're excited to report that the project will launch in the coming weeks via a request for proposals. To give a very brief synopsis of the project, it has three purposes. First, to assist at least six towns in understanding their climate risks and equity considerations, and then to enable them to start taking action on those priorities. Second, to enable the state to learn best practices for engaging and supporting communities and for filling those capacity gaps where local, regional, and state levels need some additional help. And then third, to demonstrate not just the need for this capacity building, but the good work that can happen when we invest in community and regional support for climate action. And so GoPIF will contract with three service providers via an RFP process. And these providers will recruit communities to participate in the project as part of their RFP proposals. The project we expect will run into early 2022. And we're looking to foster regional cooperation as a way to build that capacity on the ground and make efficient use of our funding and staffing resources along the way. The process is, or the project is made entirely possible through philanthropic support. So as I close, I wanna thank the organizations and individuals who supported this work and especially Sandy Buck and the council whose coordination with the philanthropy community was invaluable. We're excited to get this project started and we'll share our progress with the council over the coming year. Thanks very much, Dave. back to you, David. Okay, great. All right, so that's a lot of information. Thanks everyone uh, for sharing that info. Let's talk about your reactions to it. I do wanna you know, kick this off by asking Director Pingree, if you want to say anything right now about how the council could be most helpful as this, uh, you know, immense amount of work gets moving this month, next month, and the following month, do you want to say anything now, uh, Hannah, about that? Yeah, I mean, I so and and I'll also please welcome Melanie to to also add her answers to that question. I think I think. Really, it's a good question for all of you. I think you've heard a lot. We, there's there's many different initiatives coming before the main legislature. Some of them are, are heavier lifts than others. Some of you are already engaged in the legislative process, and some of you may want to have no interest in ever being engaged in the legislative process. Um, so I, I think in many ways, you know, we certainly see a need for, for organization and outreach to um, to people across Maine, but specifically to um, members of the Maine legislature as we try to move some of these things forward. So really, I, I think um, there, are, there, are, there are many places to be helpful. Again, some of you are already engaged. So I, I would love to hear to what extent people would like to plug in and sort of continue to participate in trying to move some of these things forward. It is absolutely not an obligation, um, but it's an area where, where we will keep you posted, but are interested in sort of how people would like to engage. Um, again, there are many commissioners on this call, you know, folks like Michael Stoddard who are already incredibly engaged. So um, not asking you to do any more, but just would love to hear from others as well as to how you um, imagine you would like to continue to move this forward and, and to what degree um, we could be helpful in, in facilitating that. Um, I don't know, Mel Melanie, you wanna add anything else to that? Sure. Thanks, Anna. Um, I guess I would just note that, you know, you all are where so many of these recommendations came from. And so as legislation's being considered, you know, it'll be important for you to be engaged, as Hannah said, to the extent that you want and continuing to bring forward the ideas and the information that you brought to the council's process in support of the legislation that aligns with the plan's recommendations, but also if there are other things that are inconsistent with what you know, was the result of a consensus-based 
decision-making process to remind legislators of that as well, that there was a plan that got us to this set of recommendations. And we really want to continue to be able to focus on those things and not go completely astray down too many little side paths as well. Um, and with that, I apologize. I have to drop off because I have to go talk to the legislature now. So thank you all very much for joining us this morning. And I look forward to continuing to work with all of you. Excellent. Good luck, Melanie. All right. Yeah. Best of luck. Okay, so let's, uh, comments, questions, doubts, um, good ideas that folks want to share. We have some time here to have a conversation about all this. How is all this landing as you hear this slew of activity going on? Reactions? I, I'd like to react to um, Brian and Brett's presentation on the six towns. I think that's really important and it kind of mirrors what I'm a bill that I have in that that wants to help ensure main municipalities and municip multi municipal regions of every size and capacity have guidance on cl climate adaptation and resilience strategies for policy implementation and investment decision support. And I think after conversation on that, I, I really want to follow that program. I think that that is going to inform uh, this bill. And, and if I if I understood correctly, it's going to be done on the it's going to be a, a year program, or or finishing in early 22. Um, and I, I guess I would like some more details on that program from Brian, and maybe we could have a conversation about that, uh, because I think that that's you know it, it, there's a lot of good pilot programs already happening. For instance, in Southern Maine, we have a good pilot example of how regionalization can help municipalities, for example, with resilience. So how is that gonna be incorporated into this uh, RFP and, and, and bringing those things together and in some legislation um, that we can then, but I, what I'm hoping is, is that, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong in thinking this way, if we legislate some of these requirements, let's say, or our help to, to help our towns be more resilient, then we're forming a, a, a place for money when we get money from the feds or whatever to put put into the towns. That's was some, one of my goals as well. Um, so anyway, that that's that that struck me. And I just have one one question for uh, Dan Burgess. What is the real purpose of the research array? What, what exactly do you expect to, to learn from that? Um, why do we really need that? Don't we know that it already works, I guess? Could we, let's do the first set of questions around, um, around the planning pilot. And Brian, do you wanna say a few words about that and then we'll go to the research array? Sure, thanks David. And Representative, those are great observations and questions. And I will say that the timeline of the project is structured so that we get some important learning by the end of this year ahead of the next legislative session so we can start to inform some of the things that you and the legislature will be thinking about. Um, and, and so absolutely, yeah, we can work closely. I can share um, some project updates with you along the way and happy to make that learning, um, not just from what we learned from this project, but incorporating other good work that's going along throughout the state in Southern Maine and other parts of the coastline for sure. Um, and I didn't uh, mention in, in my presentation, but we're really looking to learn also what inland communities are doing as far as where they're making action now and what their needs are and the best ways to support inland communities. So it's a big focus of the project as well. And we're trying to tie all the learning from different parts of the state together through this. Great. You and, just I mean, we, and we will definitely, um, Representative Bloom, sh you know, share the RFP with all of you because I think we are seeking a diverse group of service providers. And I think we want to hold up those communities already doing good work, but then we the communities that don't have the resources and, and are not able to start doing this work, we want to honestly understand, you know, what would it take for the state to implement these programs, you know, because we clearly are at, at a disadvantage, um, you know, compared to where even the state was 10 years ago in this front in terms of technical assistance to communities. So I think we are, we are looking to carefully rebuild them. And again, I just want to reiterate what Brian said, um, Sandy Buck, as well as the kind of a climate funders group of philanthropists really got together to help us do this. That is not a long-term solution. That is really a way to pilot this work and it will require um, 
government support in some way uh, going forward. So I think we really want to see what works first and be able to make the strongest case possible to the legislature uh, next January. So with your help, Representative Bloom, I'm sure. Yes, and it, what, what's great though, is that this pilot project will be the reason that I can hold over this bill until next session to complete it, which is great. Excellent, okay. Um, let's talk for a moment about the research array. I wonder, Dan, if you wanna speak a little bit about the, the intent behind that initiative. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, um, so the, there is significant offshore wind development happening from just to the south of us, from Massachusetts down to North Carolina, over close to 30,000 megawatts in the in the pipeline. Um, all of that, 99.9% .9 of that, or all that is is fixed bottom technology. Maine has really uh, led uh, and pioneered floating technology, and the Gulf of Maine being so deep, the opportunity for for offshore wind in Maine is is floating. There are a handful of projects around the world that are relying on floating and our, those technologies are, are being advanced. And so this is, this is a stepwise approach we've got to, uh, to, to this development to not just test the technology as it gets developed in a, you know, um, 10 to 12 turbines, but to really look at, um, and the main point of it is to um, see the impacts and to mitigate impacts on um, fishing industry habitat understand the uh, marine wildlife, uh, other environmental issues as this, um, this moves forward. So it is really a, uh, those commercial scale projects are commercial scale. This is a, a smaller research focused uh, project that's looking at, again, technology and then all the other um, um, uh, items that I mentioned. Um, that's a, a short answer for a pretty big topic, but ha so happy to provide more now or later. Great, okay. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? Um, some people are having a hard time seeing the hand raise feature and maybe it's the version of Zoom that we've got right now. I don't know, it should be either down where you have a reactions tab at the very bottom or it's underneath the, the list of participants on the right hand side. If it's in neither place, I apologize. Just open up your mic and shout. Um, I know I've gotten a couple, uh, Ken Colburn, you wanna go ahead? Sure, um, two, two things. One, I wanna give a shout out to a couple of efforts that are underway on the energy front. Um, they started actually before uh, our work concluded, but they'll be very helpful uh, for our second uh, major strategy that Dan alluded to with respect to um, the transforming power sector. Uh, one was initiated by TNC and it's called the Main Utility Regulatory Reform and Decarbonization Initiative. It involves most or many at least of Maine's uh, energy policymakers and advocates and utilities and so forth. So it is actually a, a major step forward with respect to what uh, Dan and I and the Energy Work Group anticipated uh, for our study going forward. Uh, it should allow us a jump start when it concludes uh, in late February or early March. A second is that under the leadership of Phil Bartlett at the Public Utilities Commission, uh, an inquiry has been launched with respect to uh, how utilities are measured and how they might uh, perform better, how they could be regulated differently uh, to meet various goals, including reliability and customer service, and of course, climate. So those, those two initiatives are most welcome and should help us in our efforts going forward. Um, uh, my second comment relates to um, how encouraging it is to see an administration federally that is not intent on climate obstruction. Uh, however, um, that still provides us both an opportunity and a responsibility and Hannah, this may fall to you more than most, or Melanie as well. And, and that is uh, now we will have good intentions, uh, but we all know that sometimes good intentions don't deliver. Um, and a good example of that is uh, what might happen at EPA with the Clean Power Plan. Uh, we don't want to pick up where we left off there because the goals of the Clean Power Plan have already been achieved and exceeded in terms of their schedule of uh, carbon reductions by what's happened in the marketplace and the declining costs of solar and wind and so forth. So I, I uh, hope that Maine will be in a position to provide input federally uh, to alleviate 
any mistracking of good intentions, as opposed to just uh, hearing from the feds about what they intend to do. I think Maine is leading on this issue to a, to a healthy extent. And so we do have some constructive input as opposed to just hearing some of the good things that they now have underway. Thanks. Thanks, Ken. That's a great update. Appreciate that. Um, anybody else? And I am being told that that hand raise function is under the list of participants on your far hand right. If you if you can see that list of participants at the bottom, there should be a hand raise. But again, open up your mic and shout um, if you need to uh, say something. You're not seeing that. Anything I else think, you want to say about all the sections? Yeah, go ahead. I think, yeah, Matt, yeah. go for it. I see Matt. We just elevated him. He was calling in. Hey everyone, it's Matt Schwobohm with the main AFL-CIO. I'm on the phone today, but a uh, great conversation and good, um, really good information. Um, I wanted to lift up the governor's initiative around job creation in the renewable energy economy. And I just, I think it's such a linchpin to our long-term success with this work um, and kind of winning a super majority of hearts and minds in the state and winning across you know, uh, east and west, north and south. Um, and and so I think that piece of our work and the economic impact and the jobs argument um, is just really important to consistently lift up across everything we do in our messaging, in legislation coming forward, in the various ways that um, climate council members serve as ambassadors for this plan and this work. Um, and the, the addendum I would just put on that is I think it's really important that we think about and pursue policy measures to ensure that as much as humanly possible, those 30,000 jobs that we want to double and create and build um, are as high quality as possible. And I think if you look at the clean energy economy right now, it's a pretty mixed bag. You have you know, skilled trades where there's labor shortages and very tight labor markets. And if you're an electrician, your wages are naturally pushing up and you have folks doing other kinds of work, weatherization, other parts of um, this economy that are pretty low road right now are not family supporting, there are not career ladders. And so I think there are a number of policy tools at our disposal. And I think, um, and it would, it, we should just think about on things where we don't automatically bring a job quality or a labor standards lens, um, like a bond package, like a, um, you know, renewable portfolio standard 3.0, like how do we incorporate um, workforce training measures? How do we incorporate prevailing wage measures? How do we incorporate local hire? How do we incorporate um, racial justice and equity and marginalized community hiring practices incentives um, to build the strongest economy we can? So just, just a shout out for the governor's vision on that and a shout out that we all think about how do we build um, the best quality jobs in this economy, both for the good of the, um, the the benefits folks will see in their families and their lives from that, but also for the political durability of this project that we're all embarked on together. Excellent. Thanks, Matt, so much. Thanks for joining. Um, okay, uh, I see a hand from Anya. Anya, please go ahead. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, I just wanted to share uh, something that I'm personally feeling excited about. Um, related to um, you know, what everyone's been, been talking about with, um, with increased federal support, uh, which is really great. Um, just wanted to put it on everyone's radar that the National Clean Energy and Sustainability Accelerator, which is like the National Climate Bank uh, legislation is going to be reintroduced in the House and Senate today, which um, would call for 100 billion, 100 billion of federal investment in climate solutions. Um, and in, in Maine, we also have the Maine Clean Energy and Sustainability Accelerator as kind of a state model, which now has bipartisan legislation submitted. Um, so just in general, just wanted to shout out feeling excited about, um, you know, where, where we're headed. That's great. Great. Thanks, Anya. Okay. Anything else and on I this? I just, of wanted, I just wanted to actually, uh, that's super helpful, Anya, and we're definitely paying close attention to those bills and to Matt's point. I think um, Dan uh, is working on some exciting stuff. Our two offices are, are really thinking about the job and innovation issues and actually looking forward to working with 
uh, many of you on this Zoom screen on that. So um, just stay tuned. But again, I, I, I appreciate Matt. And I think that the governor hears you and we're trying to think about some really specific things we can do even the next couple of months as, as people are uh, unemployed and seeking jobs. And we have some of these exciting clean energy opportunities as well. So I just think that's a, a really good point and one that has been really gotten some some focus and we hope to have some exciting announcements in the next couple months. So thanks, Matt. That's great. Okay. Um, anybody else? Yeah, there you go. Michael, go ahead. Yeah, just further to that point Hannah made and, uh, and others, um, there were some bills passed a couple of years ago requiring Maine to update its building codes for new construction. And uh, those are making their way through the rulemaking process and going to become effective um, shortly. Um, and it's a pretty big jump from where the building codes were um, beforehand. And that's going to require some training, not only for code enforcement officers, but also the entire builder community that is involved in new construction. And there seems to be a fair amount of that going on these days. So um, Efficiency Main Trust is partnering with um, the office in state government, which is the, the fire marshal's office, um, to uh, fund and provide some of that training on a pretty intensive basis over the next 12 months. So I uh, just wanted to report some good news that we have some funds available and there will be a bunch of training. Um, I don't know if that will create new jobs, but it will definitely uh, increase the quality of the work that's being done in the workforce. Fantastic. Okay, great. So um, before we jump to our last little piece, which um, Sarah and Tony Ronzio are gonna give a, a, a comment about sort of metrics and how we're tracking progress, I just want to flag as well for everybody who's listening into this call and you have something you want to say, um, the website uh, still has, uh, you know, its comment features and its opportunity to provide input all still up and running. So we welcome folks to use those features on the website to transmit ideas and reactions um, to the Climate Council. Um, anything else before we pivot to our last piece today? Okay, great. So I'll ask Sarah Kern and Tony Ronzio to hey. walk us through some ideas they're having around. Oh, is someone trying to jump in on the phone? Yeah, Judy was on, had raised her hand. Yeah, sorry, I must okay. need to. Great. Sorry, thanks, David. I must need to update because I cannot find that little hand. Uh, but I just wanted everybody <laughs> to know um, all you know, attendees and panelists, uh, Pete Slavinsky has just announced the second edition of the Maine Coastal Property Owner's Guide to Erosion, Flooding and Other Hazards. This is an update of a 2011 publication and it is just full of resources. So it's on the uh, uh, digitalmaine.com forward slash MGS publications. Um, it's a long link if you need, if you're interested in it. Um, just shoot me an email, but um, really, really good update that it's property owner's guide, but I think a lot of municipalities would find this guide super helpful as well. So I just wanted everybody to be aware of that um, given the breadth of the audience here. Thanks. Thanks, Judy. That's great. Pat, go ahead, please. Yeah, just a quick, uh, I'm always looking at the bioeconomy and I just wanted folks to know that we're working with DECD as part of the four main project and international consultants and we're bringing people into Maine to look at uh, capital investments in uh, bio-based product manufacturing. So that's occurring as we speak. We're focusing on uh, uh, cross-laminated timber. So when I look at legislation, I look at uh, sort of refunding the MTI uh, competitive grant process and uh, investment in the tax credit uh, uh, program increasing the cap might help uh, organizations like Glow Lab build Go Lab build their uh, uh, their wood insulation plant. So there's a lot of uh, interesting things going on, and I think the lead by example is going to be really important for us. Um, and I know the governor is interested in in uh, building facilities made with wood and using uh, products from wood. So that's 
an ongoing uh, effort by the industry and DECD that's going right now. And uh, the building codes uh, are being modified to, uh, to deal with uh, other wood products and put them in a better uh, position as well. So lots of activity from the private sector working back uh, and with the, the government on climate change initiatives. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Pat. Thanks so much. Okay, anything else, folks, before we do our last piece here around metrics and communication? Great. Okay, um, so Sarah and Tony, why don't you walk us through uh, what you wanted to say about metrics and keeping track of how things are going? Yeah, thanks, David. Um, I'll just sort of introduce the topic briefly and then turn it over to Tony. I'm, it's so exciting to hear all of the activity <laughs> and initiatives and updates. Um, and I think one of the things that we're working at is um, how to, to capture all of that and communicate it. So I think we wanted to share briefly with you today how we're thinking about metrics and tracking activity, um, creating a sense of momentum and being able to communicate to different audiences how the activity and efforts that they're undertaking fit into the bigger picture. Um, we'll spend a lot of time on this topic in May at the May Council meeting, but we wanted to preview some of the things that we're doing right now. So excited to have Tony share with you a couple of specifics. Thank you, Sarah. And hello, everybody. It's great to see everyone. I'm glad I finally got a chance to use my new May Won't Wait Zoom background. Uh, it's currently uh, hiding my daughter's fort, which was made during the snow day yesterday. So it came in handy. Um, we have the easy job of trying to track all this great momentum. And so uh, the slide that you see here were proposed KPIs that are in the back of the climate action plan that we uh, considered to be good metrics that we could possibly use to track our progress. Um, and so we're gonna start here over the next couple of months and try to um, create a baseline uh, internal dashboard, um, track some of these metrics, identify how these metrics should be tracked, who owns some of this data, who owns um, some of this progress to be able to um, uh, really find the signal and the noise inside our progress as a climate action plan. So, um, this is very much a, a, new, um, a new initiative. Um, we are getting started. We've hired a consultancy that's gonna help us build this internal dashboard over the next couple of months. Um, some of this data is tracked now. Some of this data has never been tracked. Some of this data is tracked across multiple entities and agencies. Um, and a good example, and, and Sarah and I were talking about this yesterday, is, is uh, thinking about it in the context of charging stations for electric vehicles, which are, um, uh, installed, you know, through measures that we know very well, like through the Volkswagen rebate program through EMT, but are also being installed, you know, through outside programs, which we don't have a lot of visibility into. And so um, part of our work over the next couple of months is going to be identifying where all this good work is happening and trying to build an internal tool first to get our arms around it and then eventually translate that into an external dashboard for the public. Um, which was outlined in strategy H of the climate action plan. And so the next slide I think goes into that a little bit. Yep. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, the first bullet will be, you know, a single internal dashboard to track some of the key metrics that we've identified. And then the other part that I'm really excited about, and I know Dr. Rose is excited about is we have a tremendous amount of scientific data that was uh, created for the climate action plan by the STS committee. And what we would like to do and gonna, are gonna work on is um, kind of like an interactive visualization that takes historical data, real-time monitoring data and projections that have been created by, um, created for, by STS or, or for the Climate Council report and create an interactive visualization on air temperature, ocean surface temp temperature and sea level rise. Um, that one is, I think something that's really important for um, climate education. Uh, making sure that science is first and foremost, um, and also takes advantage of the great work that's been done. And so we're going to work on both of those projects over the next couple of months and hopefully have something to launch by late April, early May. And that is what I've got for everybody. Great. Well, thank you, Tony. Awesome. And I... Go for it, David. Go ahead. <laughs> Well, I see. I see. Lydia Bloom was uh, Representative Bloom was going to say something as well. So I'll I'll 
I'll um, let her. Thank you. I, I just wanted to say, what happened to ocean acidification in that ocean, dashboard chart? Ocean acidification is something that, that can be, and I, full disclosure, not a scientist, so I open, open up to the scientist to help me on this question, um, was discussed as something that should be tracked in the idea of getting something that we could launch in the next couple of months, it would be something that'd be on a roadmap for later on after these three, after these three, after these three points. So I'd say that that's something for the future, but not for the present and the first iteration of this work. Okay. Well, I'd, I'd like to, I'm, I'm going to talk a little further Happy about that. Day. We do Happy have day. a lot of data. Happy to speak on that. I think. Um, in this initial dashboard, we tried to work with data sources that are readily available. Um, and updated frequently. And um, I, I want to work with the STS on collecting all of the ocean acidification data sources. Um, my understanding was that there, there wasn't one sort of centralized, very accessible data source on ocean acidification data in the Gulf of Maine um, at present. I'm still working through that. Um, totally want to recognize that this is not a complete list of data. This is a proof of concept that we'll um, hopefully be able to build on into the future. Um, but we're, we're working through some easily accessible, very high quality data sources um, and projections to pull all this together um, in a way that hasn't been done for, uh, for main data, base data yet. And I think, I mean, I think it just highlights the, at our May meeting, I think we'll be sort of fully into the legislative session, but we also want to focus the Climate Council on helping us hone some of how we think about metrics and report it out and then how we communicate in general. And I think that even this metrics conversation, you know, showing the main public climate data so that they can just see for themselves and follow it as well as uh, being accountable to the outcomes and the metrics that we've set for ourselves and that we continue to set, like the equity subcommittee will certainly recommend additional metrics. So that is kind of the, the bulk of the work, I would say, for us as a council to, to wrestle with in May and, and even throughout the year, because I think as we dig into this, we'll realize some of these data sources are are not easy and they only, you know, the con conserved lands took people a couple years to come up with that. A year or two ago, can can we actually monitor that on an ongoing basis? So I think we will definitely look to the council and many of the experts to help us do that. So um, I think it's um, definitely an open question. And Representative Bloom, we definitely we we look forward to thinking with you on issues like ocean acidification. What more can be done? So. All right. Okay. Great. Uh, we're getting towards the end. Any comments, final comments from uh, council members before we wrap up? Anything else? Just feel free to open your mic and just start talking if the hand raise thing's not working. Okay. Kate Great. Dempsey, Kate Dempsey oh. did also um, point out the new um, efficiency main program for municipalities. So. Thank you, Kate, and thank you, Michael Stoddard. Yeah, um, thanks, thanks, Efficiency Maine for the awesome program. Right, and so that's a live RFP for uh, municipalities, right? So folks, if you're listening in, if you are part of a municipality or can influence one, this is an opportunity to, to, to get some support for um, energy efficiency measures. Smaller than population of 4,000, so it's for smaller towns. Heat pumps Great. and lighting, special deal. Great. Okay. Awesome. Okay, folks, I think we're there. Um, Hannah, um, you want to wrap us up with any final comments before we sign off? Yeah, I just want to um, thank you all again. I mean, I guess I will say that this call, this hour and a half kind of reflects um, a lot of exciting action that is happening. And I think it's really great to hear the updates from, from varying climate council members, both administration um, as well as advocacy groups and others just sort of talking about what's happening. And I think we as a staff group, but I think all of us as a council, I think how we wrap this information up and project it out to the main public and make sure people can easily access it 
is really one of our challenges over the next couple months. Um, I will say that uh, like Dan Cleveland has sort of said, well, let's get going on, on the business group. And I think we are thinking about the varying aspects of climate activity and really how do we make sure the main public is hearing about it. And I think we will use these meetings as a forum to continue to think about how to do that. Um, we will look to all of your advice on that and it will be putting this into a more systematic uh, communications realm will be part of the work of the council over the next year. So, um, you know, I feel incredibly enthused about what's happening. Clearly there's a lot to do to really make it stack up into the actions that we have now, you know, put out there as a part of the plan. Um, so bear with us, continue to stay in touch. And, and again, I, I think um, we're just really grateful for all of your partnership because I think as you heard in this call, there's a lot happening um, and we just are stacking it together to make it really add up to what will be significant action. Um, I will say that Melissa Law sent me a text during this saying, are there any new cl climate council members? Um, we are anticipating uh, new appointments from legislative leadership um, to the climate council. Uh, there are two vacant seats that we're currently in the process of appointing via the governor. So we will keep folks um, updated on, on new climate council members. But again, we are very grateful for the 39 we have um, on this screen, as well as the other uh, working group uh, co-chairs. So um, again, we'll keep you posted. Um, we are now seeing the screen of our upcoming meetings. You've made it through February 3rd. So uh, we'll see everyone again on May 19th. Um, and again, we certainly look forward to questions and comments prior to that, because I think we'll be uh, in a very different place in terms of hopefully what may happen in both the main legislature and in Washington, D.C. Um, over the coming months. So thank you all. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Members of the public or others who are weighing in, please feel or watching, watching please feel free to weigh in on the uh, website. Uh, welcome the comments there. Take care. We'll see all of us together again in May um, and have a great day. Take care, everybody.